Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheila Bowman. I'm with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. We're extremely pleased to be here and have a chance to thank you, but also to meet each one of you Googlers and, of course, um, hopefully encourage you and invite you to join us down at the Monterey Bay Aquarium when you have free time. Um, all the programs that we do really depend on great folks like you coming in, supporting us. And one of our programs that we're especially here to talk about today is, of course, our Sustainable Seafood Program. And I'm going to um, take this opportunity to welcome and introduce to those who don't know Chef Rick Moonen, who's come to us this morning from Las Vegas, where he has two successful restaurants. And really, um, beyond that, I think everyone who knows Rick knows he has a world of experience beyond that from TV, Top Chef, Master's program. Um, he travels the world, in my opinion, is the foremost chef who is speaking out on sustainable seafood issues, educating himself, engaging really at the level of um, fish farmers who don't know how to improve and want to improve, all the way through to these <coughs> premium products, the folks who have made this conversion, who have done great work, who are providing sustainable seafood, helping promote them so that all of us can enjoy this great fish that's come, come so far. And in so many cases, um, we have environmental heroes out there where we can support them and, and still enjoy delicious food. So I think I'm gonna just go ahead and turn things over to Rick, because I know he's gotta get the lentils started. So please, everybody, um, Seafood Watch spokesperson and my good friend, Rick Moonen. Thanks, Sheila, that's great. What a tremendous privilege to be able to be standing here in front of all of you. Just because not only is it the mentality of the Google campus and, the, and Google world, I might as well say, but it's, it's, it's your generation. It's you. You are the thinkers. You are the future. I've been focused on sustainability for my, my entire career. I graduated culinary school in the 70s, 1978, first in my class. Yay. But I worked with some great chefs that instilled in me an integrity, a respect, a connection and an understanding about our environment. Healthy environment equals healthy food. Better, better uh, um, um, healthy environment makes tasty, delicious, nutritious, real food. And the biggest problem today that we're facing, well not the biggest, but one of them, one of many, unfortunately, is that um, the food that we consume is oftentimes so processed that our bodies don't even see it as food anymore. It doesn't recognize it. It, and, and, and that's when immunity systems start to break down and all kinds of stuff happens. That's a whole nother topic of discussion, but it's just something I want to open up because real food equals healthy health. You're going to be healthy. Every atom of your body is a result of something you've consumed or something you've come in contact with. So let's be a little bit more um, connected to that food, to that source. And that's really about the responsibility of how I define sustainability, sustaining, keeping, making sure there's enough for tomorrow, for, for tomorrow's dinner, for the next generation, your children, yourselves, and everything else going on down the line. Without putting our toys away at the end of the night, we're not gonna be able to have them tomorrow to play with, right? It's pretty simple. So um, I'm gonna do that through a cooking demonstration, but really the opportunity is to have this ongoing discussion. And if I can change the way you think a little bit today, then I've succeeded. If I can connect you to a great source of information to help you along as you're like, I got a little bit of it, but I need more, then we're gonna talk about Seafood Watch and what they've done and what they do every single day. They've got a team of people in Monterey that are connecting to a crazy network of scientists, environmental groups, people that are me government, that are me they're measuring, you know, and taking census of uh, different species of fish and stuff, measuring their, 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 their uh, potential to be able to reproduce enough to produce what we want for the following year. A lot goes into this. And I'm not here to scare you about it, but I hope that you'll be motivated to know more about your food at the end of this. Geez, I didn't know that. All right, now I, got, now I know more. So let's get the lentils started. Anyway, <laughs> what I'm gonna show you today is I'm, I'm choosing a, okay, so how do I define sustainability? Well, we're gonna do that when the lentils start. Because these, these lentils, brown or green lentils are the lentils that you wanna work with. All those other colored lentils are real pretty, but they turn to mush. They just do. So I'm just gonna put some cold water on some dry lentils. You don't have to pre-soak them. It's not necessarily um, um, a, a, a requirement. As a matter of fact, I, I never do. I just put cold water on the, on the fire, bring it up slowly, simmer it very, very gently, and then towards the end, I'll season it with salt. If you salt it in the very beginning, it, it has a tendency to take longer to cook, be more uneven, etc. So that's lentils 101. Yay, we got that out of the way. Another thing, because I am in love 
with uh, Moroccan spices right now, Indian spices. I think, you know, what's the movie, A Hundred Foot Journey or something? What is it called? How many people have seen that? It's a cool movie. I and mean, the coolest part of it was when the guy pulled out this box of jars of mixtures and spices from his mother. He's like, and the guy ended up, you know, with three-star Michelin restaurant. That blew my mind. It's that depth of flavor that we're kind of going for. It's the new palette of intrigue. It's the depth of smell. Turmeric, ooh, really good. Turmeric's good because it's anti-inflammatory and it helps get rid of all the pains. Food does that. Food can and always will do that. It'll help solve 90% of, of, of uh, concerns and health issues, my opinion, okay? So how do, how do we go about that? Take everything that starts with a C in your whole spice counter, and that's pretty much what you're gonna end up with. Coriander, coriander seeds. Also, if you put, planted that in the ground, what would it grow up into? Cilantro, that's correct. I'll help you out. Okay, this is cumin. Very deep, very rich, very earthy, very delicious, um, you know, um, Widely used, many, many different cuisines. You're going to see it from Greek, Mediterranean, Indian, Moroccan, cumin. Um, this begins with an F, so we're not going to go there yet. These are cloves, whole cloves, very oily, very deep. A lot of, um, um, well, cloves, you know, it's what you, they stick them in ham when they roast them. It's got a real distinctive flavor. So you only want a couple of those because that's very strong. This, cardamom, cardamom. Really, really interesting. You got green, you got black, you got different ones. There's little seeds inside. We use the whole green cardamom when we're uh, making uh, this particular spice blend. And then, so that's everything with a C. Coriander, cumin, uh, not, yeah, coriander, cumin, uh, uh, cardamom, and cloves. And then we get some fennel because we need a little F in there, I guess. Fennel. You can add cinnamon in there. Often used turmeric, you can add to it. You know, and then you're starting to go into like a curry style. This isn't so much like a curry style. This is, this is gonna be based on some heat. I want some spice. So in order to get those uh, flavors out of there, I wanna toast it. So that's why I'm putting it in a dry pan. I have it on a medium heat and I wanna toast them. Difference between a piece of white bread, stick it in this little machine, push down the thing, pops out toast. Big difference, same product. It's kind, same, kind of the same idea here, right? You wanna get the, and you're gonna start to smell those, the, the, the aroma, the aromatics out of it. So I'm keeping it simple to five, but you can put up to 10 different spices in there. Good base, what I just showed you. Um, lentils are cooking, and um, I'm going to get back to sustainability while well, this happens. This had to start real quick, soon because it takes a little bit of time. Do not participate in the activity that brings a species to an extinction. So important ecosystem. Everything works in conjunction with each other. Every living thing on our planet plays a role. It was put here. We didn't, you know, invent plants or, 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 or any animals that are on here. They all have a function that helps the earth stay healthy and, and go around. You would never think of taking something out of your car engine, driving down the highway and say, hmm, you know, I'm just going to pull something out and expect the engine to run the same. It would not. That's, that's ridiculous. Yet, if we allow something to get, fall out of the, the ecosystem, then we create an imbalance. An imbalance, then we have to try to repair. You try to repair it, you over-repair. It's oversteering. It's all over the road. You can't do it. Study nature, emulate it, respect it. Earth will be healthy, environment will be healthy, we'll be healthy. Okay, I know I've repeated it. I'm not gonna bring it up again, except maybe four more times. <laughs> okay, so in, intriguing spice mix, lentils. I'll explain what uh, alternatives to lentils, too. You know, uh, a lot of times I'll just do what I call cauliflower rice. You know what that is? You take a box grate, you take a whole head of raw cauliflower, you just, <laughs> and just saute it really quick, boom. Instantaneous, gluten-free, grain-free, whatever free you want to go down, whatever road is, is floating your boat at, the per at that moment. There's, there's really great vegetables that help you to do that. Okay, I want to make here a, um, a harissa sauce, or a fiery hot um, tomato sauce, because... Um, Somehow vinegar, acidity, works really, really, really well with, um, with, with seafood. Take a piece of fish, put it in a pan, cook it. What's the first thing you need to do? Squeeze a lemon on it. It works. Acidity and fish protein are, are, are just meant to be. So we kind of got the idea of sustainability, right? You know, not, not allowing something to go bad. But there's a lot to that. What does that mean? It means I encourage you to learn more about your food. Ask questions. B, curious. The dumbest question that you could have is the question that's not asked. Because once you ask that question for a brief moment, you may feel awkward, but then now you know the answer. 
So now you're smarter. You know, you've, 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 you've expanded the, the, uh, your, your, your base of knowledge of, of, and connectedness to the environment, which is what I highly recommend. You know, if you can't grow produce in your backyard, which I also recommend, get connected through your food, right? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, aquaculture. Aquaculture. What's aquaculture? That's when we're farming fish. Hmm. Isn't there enough fish in the ocean? to feed us anyway? Why do we need farms? Well, over half the food from the ocean that's consumed every single day globally comes from a farm now. That's pretty big. So is aquaculture good or bad? Show of hands, is it good? How many people think aquaculture is good? One, don't you raise your hand, you're gonna influence people. Right, aquaculture has a bad reputation. It does. It is, uh, been proven to be detrimental to our environment because of the learning curve. Farming fish is not something that has happened uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. This is decades old. It's new technology. A lot of mistakes have been made in order to try to keep up with the booming um, aquaculture interest. You know, so the guys that go into uh, to, to fish farming 20, 25 years ago, they didn't know how to deal with sea lice or escapes or fish in fish out ratio. You even think about it. You're raising carnivores. Carnivores. Imagine if you bring that onto land for a minute. All right, we're going to raise carnivores on land for consumption in our, you know, if you go to a grocery store, there's only one category of carnivores that you can buy and it's fish. Because fish eat fish. And that's no big deal. But if you're going to be farm raising lions for dinner, right, we're going to have lions. I love lion. Don't you love lion? Delicious. You think about how it's going to be farmed. Kind of gross, kind of weird. We're going to have to go get some protein, animal protein. Could be your dog, your cat, anything. And it's going to, could be rodents. And that's not cool. See, that gets weird. So let's, let's pull it into the category of, okay, now this is, this is now getting a little bit toasty. You can smell it. You can see the, the little bit of a poofiness coming out of there from, the, from, the, uh, from just the haze of heat. Um, so farming of fish has had major issues. But the good news is big companies are starting to do it a little bit better. They're starting to learn how the fish in, fish out ratio. In other words, because it's a carnivore, if it takes five pounds of some other live fish to grind up to make Purina fish chow to feed this fish in order to have a farmed product come out onto our dinner plate, well, what's the ratio? If it takes five pounds to make one pound, not so good. Even if it's sardines or something you hate anyway, gross, you can have all the sardines you want, eat them all, Ugh. right? No, because there's a lot of other things that you do like that like sardines, that eat it. It's necessary, you want to keep the sardines happy, you want them to have a healthy population, and I encourage you to try sardines, but that's not today's discussion. You know, it's about fish in, fish out. So they're becoming a lot more efficient about that. The feed, it's a big topic. There's a lot of other topics, and I could talk to you for, two hours about that and I only have 35 minutes. How many minutes are you left? I gotta know how, to, how quickly I have to go. So aquaculture was and for many years has been kind of a problem because you put a ton of fish in a small area of the open uh, ocean, you put a pen there, a net basically, throw in a bunch of baby fish and then you start to grow them but you put a ton of them in there. So now you've got this stressful situation because they're kind of like, not, it's not natural environment. One of them gets sick, they all get sick, you have to use antibiotics. One of them gets a little thing of some lice on them, they all get lice, it's an epidemic, you gotta use some chemicals to get rid of them. The chemicals, get, the chemicals that are used to get rid of lice, which is basically a crustacean, might have a little bit of an effect, especially in Maine, where the lobsters are, because the lobster is just a big, you know, bug anyway. So that's really what happens. We all love it, but it's the truth. It's a bug. You're talking about open net pen. Yeah, open net pen. Aquaculture. Correct. Where there's this farm with nets, and so the fish stay in, and they put the fish in there, but if they put the chemicals in, they float out to the rest of the environment. And then what we also find is, quite often, a big storm may come through, and those fish escape, right, Rick? So all of a sudden, you had three million fish in the farm, now you have two and a half million fish out of the farm. And they're competing free. for the food that the fish that live in that neighborhood need to, right. to eat. Not cool. It's like, like bus loads of people moving into your neighborhood one day and all of a sudden you're like, what the hell just happened? Well, that's what the fish of a particular area surrounding a farm, fish farm, are thinking. I think that's what they're thinking. Maybe they're not thinking at all, I don't know. Okay, so this is, this is our toasted spice mix. 
want to cool it off just a little bit, and then we're going to just put it into a spice blender, like one of these things, coffee grinder. But once you put spices into it, it's then a spice blender, because <laughs> it'll smell and, and, and have the oils, and et cetera, of the, of, the, uh, of the spices in there. So that just goes inside there. I recommend that you cool this off, because what will happen is you do it hot like I'm about to do it. You really have a cleaning project ahead of you because the, um, the oils from the, the, the clove kind of have a tendency to just stick to the, the walls, the inner lining walls of this. But what I want to do is I'm going to pass this around so you can smell it and get an idea, connect it, connect with it. And it smells so much better. You see that? It's going to, watch this. Oh. It's, it's incredible. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a little, a little sniffer. Start here, sniff around, all right? <laughs> then you keep that. This is going to go inside our sauce. This is going to go on, on the outside of our fish. We're just going to use this with reckless abandon because that's the whole idea. Okay, to make the sauce, let's uh, get this, this going. Sheila, feel free to just jump in on any conversation you might want to have here. Sure. So I think when, what you were saying, Rick, is that not all aquaculture is bad these days. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain aquaculture that you think that is pretty great that you're supporting? Oh, yeah, right now I'm looking, well, okay, for many, 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 many years, I personally am supporting um, non-carnivorous uh, uh, fish, right? So you got your tilapia, you got your catfish. Yeah. Really? Barramundi. That's what I got to work with in order to be sustainable. I got to work with these boring fish, because they are. But more and more, there's, there's, there's more intrigue and interest and flavor being introduced into some, some, uh, some of the farm-raised fish. And the ratios of the feed are becoming a little bit better. They're more cognizant of the byproduct that comes out of it called effluent, which is a beautiful little recipe of fish, poop, dead fish, and uneaten food. It's, a, it's nasty when it hits the bottom of the ocean. It turns into this suffocating blanket of death, goo. Ugh. Doesn't sound good. Needs to be treated. Something, there's a lot of protein and a lot of food in there. So you get some fish farms that are going, food? problem. Let's grow something next to it that's going to eat that food like nature does. So they plant kelp next to the fish farm, the salmon farm. And next to the kelp, they put um, uh, mussels, all different layers of the trophic uh, of, of, the, of the food chain working in conjunction to keep the ocean healthy. This is something new, which is kind of scary. This should have been the way of the world. Just Watch the way it happens naturally and try to emulate it. But no, we're men and we're, gonna, we're, we're mankind and we're going we're gonna to force our way into it. And that's not good. That's when we run into problems. So that's called integrated multitrophic aquaculture, IMTA. All right? So like, you know, YMCA, IMTA. You got it? All right. I got to look silly, but now you remember. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm just cutting up some shallots. Big deal. So this is how you cut shallots. So integrated multitrophic aquaculture. Back to the subject. Is, um, is, is pr to me, probably one of the most exciting um, um, prospects of, of feeding the planet as we grow from 7 billion to 9 billion, right? We're already having problems feeding the planet with 7 billion. How the heck are we going to do it when we have 9 billion? Not going to be such an easy thing if we don't change the way we're, we're, we're thinking. And that's why we're having this discussion right today. Because... That will change the world. That will uh, educate the, the planet, and that will help. And how do we do it in a big type, type way? Well, let's think, for instance, where and what company might be uh, crucial in getting that message out, adopting it and, 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 and putting it into, into, uh, into play? Compass, Bon Appetit. The companies that, that, are, uh, that are, are, are helping to drive what's going on in large campuses such as Google and other large campuses that are like-minded in, in, the, in the world, awesome. But it's not just enough for you to walk up, get, get lunch, and walk away. You need to connect with it a little bit more. You know, it's not just about deliciousness, and I hope it is a lot to do with just deliciousness, but it's not just that. All right, so we got shallots, we got garlic. Basic tomato sauce, you know, this is not any, and the thing that I like about this tomato sauce, it's not one of those sauces that has to cook for hours and hours and hours in order for it to be good. So we put a little bit of olive oil in the bottom of a saucepan, a little bit, a lot of bit, and then we add some shallots, and I'm still trying to learn induction a la, a la Google. Induction is just, is just a uh, type of cooking that's not flame. Right, it's magnetic actually, which is very, very cool. You have to have the right metal on it in order for it to, uh, to connect. 
So I'm just gonna make a little bit of that. Shallots and garlic, I'm gonna put them in at the same time. Let them sweat. Just cook slowly without, without, um, without browning. So that's, uh, that's what's happening there right now. And we're gonna, inter and we're gonna introduce our, our spice blend that we just made with four C's and one F. And this is a, well, the sauce calls for harissa. Harissa is a chili paste blend that's usually used in Moroccan food. It's used in couscous very, very often. Couscous is, you know, the couscous and steamed lamb and vegetables and all sorts of stuff. It can be a little bit bland, but then once you add a little bit of this, bam, it's like sriracha. It is basically, that's what this is actually. This is sriracha because we don't have harissa. So sriracha is, is the harissa of yesterday. It's the, it's, 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 it's the cool har um, harissa today. So that's what, we're, that's what we're working with. All right, so how are we doing on time? Ooh, boy, that was quick. All right, I'm gonna start preheating a pan over on, on, on this side as well, because this is where we're gonna saute our, our trout in, and I need to get to the trout in a second. So I might do a couple of things at once. I'm gonna try to kick up the, the heat on the lentils a little bit, and just like I thought, we're probably not gonna have enough time, but that comes to a simmer, then lower down to just a lazy boil. Blub, 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 all right? Test it in about 15 minutes. You take a little bit out, put it on your, on your table and squish it. Bite it, still seems really, really firm in the middle. Give it another five minutes and then you salt it, done. Drain it, lay it out on a pan to cool off, just steam, and then you end up with, you end up with this. These are, this is lentils that have been cooked in, in water for about 20 minutes. And they're just, you don't want them to be falling apart because you're gonna reheat them. And I'll show you how we do that. Okay, shallots and, and garlic have been uh, sweating for a few minutes. I'm gonna add um, some of the harissa. This is where you figure out, or sriracha, how much, how, how spicy do you want it to be? Eh, I want it to have a good kick, you know, because that's what I'm feeling today. You don't want it so hot, you put a little less in there. It's not the end of the world. That's got a little bit of a, I mean, you can feel the heat coming up in your face. That's, that's basically a chili paste, all right? Then I want it to have that Moroccan flavor. Well, I just wanted to have this little spice mix I just put together a few minutes ago. So a good, good, good pinch of that. Let that go in and mix in with your uh, sauteing hot sauce, shallots and garlic. Then we're gonna add some tomatoes and a little bit of vinegar. Vinegar being the acidity that I want in there. I want to, there's some acidity in tomato. There's also sweetness and a little bitterness, which is great because that's perfect for uh, creating a balance on your palate. But you, um, you want to add a little bit extra uh, of, of, the, of the acidity, so I add some uh, red wine vinegar. All right, there we go. Bring that, gonna bring that up to a, a little higher heat. Reduce it just a second, give everything a chance to kind of come together in the pan, and I'm gonna add some tomatoes. And we're gonna take questions, so if anyone has a question, let us know, but we're also gonna do questions at the end. But I think a lot's going on right now, so does anyone have a question? burning sriracha style question right now, or are we all good? The tomatoes are crushed from the can. These are crushed tomatoes. I personally, I, like, I, I tomatoes. try to stay away from canned anything nowadays. Canned is not good. Alzheimer's, all kinds of stuff, you know? And I believe that the stuff in boxes that you get now. Pomi, P-O-M-I, it's a brand. I'm not, I don't work for Pomi. It's not, you know, I'm not a sponsor of it. It's not a sponsor of me. But I just find that to maybe be the best. You get Pomi uh, in those little boxes you know, the strained tomatoes, the crushed tomatoes. This, I would, I would usually use just crushed tomatoes, uh, the Pomi brand. Okay, so now we've got a little simmer going on the, on the, uh, on the lentil, so I'm gonna turn it down a little, because I just want it to be lazy. Just hang out, just like floating down the river, drinking a beer on an inner tube. All right, over here, I'm preheating a pan to uh, saute the, um, I should preheat this pan as well, because I'm gonna end up with no time. All right, all right. I think I'm really getting this, this down to a science now, this, uh, not really. Turning the stove on? It's just as soon as I said that. With the spices, do you just wait until they start to smell really fragrant? Yeah, ready? just like lightly toasted. You don't, want to, you don't want to brown them or blacken them, and that's why you, I do it on a low temperature. I, usually, I like doing it in cast iron because it has a tendency to be more even heated. Okay. Oh, I had a uh, question on the uh, spices. 
Yes. Uh, so are you going to add some more later to freshen up? Because sometimes you, in some cooking, you... I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, so sometimes in cooking, you freshen up near the end. Will you be doing that? Absolutely. You're going to taste this. You're going to go, you know what? I don't taste the, 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 the spices as much as I would like to. <whistles> See, recipes are guidelines. You, your palate is different than my palate. So is yours. So is yours. You know, I like spicier food, perhaps, than you do. Add some more, add some more heat. You know, you just need the, you need the building blocks to, 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 to make the flavors happen. And it's really just suggestions according to what I think. But at the end of the day, it's really up to you. So yeah, you do refresh. This is a piece of aquaculture farm-raised brook trout from Idaho. Very nice, right? You get rainbow trout, it's got a pinker um, hue to it. They all have a decent amount of omega-3s. They're all considered very sustainable, some more so than others. There are, there's some trout available that uh, is completely vegetarian. Oh, that's good, right? I don't think that trout can really be bad because what does trout eat naturally? Bugs, worms, you know, I don't think that that's uh, becoming an endangered species at the moment. So trout is great and it's affordable. You know, I think it's, it's undervalued, really, for what it is, you know, but it's, it's, what, it's what's for dinner today. So I'm going to dry the skin side a little bit by placing it down on a um, paper towel. And I'm going to dry it up on top a little bit. Should have really no smell to it at all because it's a freshwater fish. All right, then I'm going to season it with salt. Now you can season it a little bit earlier. If you season something that's this kind of a, th this high moisture content uh, protein, such as uh, any, almost any kind of fish with salt ahead of time, what's gonna happen is the salt is gonna start to draw out the moisture. Not making it dry, but concentrating its flavor, firming up the flesh. The fat doesn't come out, just, uh, just, the, uh, just the, 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 the water content does. So I like to season things maybe a little bit ahead, which is almost like a, like a pre-cure. To the, to, the, to the fish. So now I'm gonna put some of the Moroccan spices on this as well. That's gonna carry the Moroccan flavor mostly, but just a little bit on the outside of here, why not? All right, I'm gonna trim the tail just a touch, and that gets used in a kitchen situation in all kinds of stuff. That goes in your chowder, that goes in your chipino, that goes in a multitude of pastas or whatever else that you might wanna have. Okay, lentils are still doing their lazy thing. I've got my, uh, my pan, pretty decent heat. I wanna get it really hot though. So um, while that's happening, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start heating up my lentils. So all right, let's pretend these lentils are now 20 minutes in. Take them, put them in a colander, right? I would have lightly salted them just before doing that. I would have pinched a pinch of salt in that pan, then strain them, put them out onto a pan like this to cool off. I'm just showing this for, so that you kind of have a visual. I'll shake them around and just, just leave them uh, to cool off. All right, and then, then that, that, that turns into this. Now, how am I going to, um, this tomato sauce is pretty close. This tomato, the pomi tomato has a lot more juice in it and that's kind of dry to me, right? So I'm just gonna add a little water and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pulse it in a second with my, uh, my little handheld blender. That's heating up. That's really hot, that's good. All right, so a slick of oil into the pan. Keep it from sticking. Skin side down, because I'm gonna serve the skin. I want the skin, the skin gets crispy. Hear that noise? That's what that's like, I like, I likey. That's making me happy. And you see immediately, I do that. That's to make sure it's not sticking. Okay, we're not sticking, yay because that's a pain in the neck when it sticks. If it sticks, you kind of leave it for a minute. Let it form a crust, right? You can even, if the fish is so fresh that it starts to curl up, stop it. Just, put a, just come down on it a little bit with, with a spatula to kind of fuse the skin with the hot surface, all right? That fish is gonna cook, well, I'd say 90% of the way on, on the skin side. I'll flip it over for a second and just call it a day. While that's while that's cooking, I'm gonna puree my tomato sauce by just. So Rick, should we talk a little bit about fish diversity? How many people have had trout before? Excellent. 
Really outstanding. Have you had it here at work, or have you mostly, has anyone cooked it at home? Really good. I think one of the things that's kind of fun about trout is you can also do it whole fish, kind of stuff it, and that whole fish preparation, super easy, super flavorful. It's kind of another new trend in the way people are looking at fish, but lots of people not familiar with trout, so what other fish are you guys eating? What kind of diversity is in your diet? And um, you know, Rick, I think one of the things we know is that salmon, shrimp, and tuna are our top three seafoods in this country, and it's like 80% of the fish we eat are those three fish. So one of the things that we have to know when it comes to sustainability is we got to diversify our diet because there's no way 7 billion people can live on three species of fish around the world. Yeah. So trout's a great ad. Um, crab's a great ad. We have a new <clears throat> group of fisheries here on the Pacific Coast, which is all of our rockfish, petrolley sole, sand abs. Those have all moved on to our yellow and green list at Seafood Watch. They're great choices. So um, I think it's kind of the era of weird fish. Sometimes people are calling it trash fish, fish that didn't have a lot of financial value to fishermen even two, three, four years ago. But nowadays, chefs like Rick are picking them up, making them into like real um, shining star dishes. And um, you start to see different fish on menus than just kind of the old standards. Step outside your comfort zone is what Sheila is saying. You know, generally speaking, I think people eat mostly about three or four different species of fish, and that's it. Eat something that you haven't eaten before. Give a break to that, that, that species. We love single species to, to death. We just, we, just, we just consume them until they're, they're problematic. When there's so many other things that are available, chefs are dying to work with, with, uh, with, with a more diverse uh, pantry or, or kitchen or, or refrigerator ocean uh, um, products. All right, here, this is, this is just water. Put a pinch of salt in there. I'm gonna shake some water into there, uh, some butter into there till it emulsifies, and then I'm gonna heat my, reheat my lentils in there. And then we're pretty much ready to rock. All I'm gonna need is uh, some cilantro. If you guys got some cilantro for garnish in a second. So you'll notice as you're cooking, the sides, look at the sides while, you, while something's cooking. You see the bubbles happening there? That's, that means that everything's touching the surface of the pan. If the, there's no bubbles on one side, it's probably because it, 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 it kind of humped up or something. So I see that it's starting to brown. I see that the, whites, the, the sides of it are starting to turn whiter, right? How do I know a fish is cooking? How do I know? Oh, I'm so scared. It's so expensive. Cooks so quick. It's going to get dry. Ah, no. Just look at it. You've cooked an egg. You popped a, an egg into a pan. You've seen, the, you've seen the egg white go from clear to white. That's what happens with protein. So that's kerning from clear, which is kind of the middle still, to white. So that fish is just about ready to rock and roll. I'm just gonna flip it over. All right, I get a nice little light brown. I'm gonna turn it off, right? And just let the heat of the pan carry it the rest of the way, the rest of the way through. I am not worried at all that that fish is gonna overcook. Well, a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this up front here. I'm gonna crank this up and turn that off. All right, now I'm gonna just start shaking some butter into this pan. Right, this is called a Bermonte or mounted butter. You just kind of, you can use a whisk if you want. Shake the pan. Just making a, a real simple emulsified butter. I want more, one more butter. Butter's good, butter's not bad for you. It's not, just ask Julia Child. Oh, she's dead. Sorry, not, sorry Julia. Okay, I can hear that fish cooking. It's talking to me, it wants to come out of the pan. Okay, yes, I hear you. And the funny thing about it, as soon as you flip over the fish, the skin is not crispy, but once it gets a chance to, um, to sit for a minute, you can hear it, it's kind of tick, 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 tick. crispy skin. I like crispy skin. Delicious, full of, full of nutrition. Most of the omega-3 uh, fatty acids that are so good for our brain, our body, our fun every function of your body is located between the skin and, and the flesh. So it's a little thin layer there, generally speaking. So whenever possible, or when you, whenever you're cool with it, eat the skin or, or consume the skin. So I'm adding the lentils to this, this, this Bermonte, this emulsified butter. Basically just reheating them. And sometimes at the grocery store, you have to ask for fish that still has the skin on. We're very much into white fillets, but I know a lot of people are starting to ask for that, Rick, because it's yeah. 
kind of fun to cook and good flavor. I'm, I'm 100%. I've been, I've been eating skin on fish forever, but not, not everybody. I, I find that you know plates come back and the skin's been pulled off nicely and placed on the side. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you to step outside your comfort zone maybe a little bit. All right, so I'm putting down this spicy, fiery hot. We didn't, we didn't do something that's real important. Obviously tomato. It's got some good heat, great acidity. Level of uh, Moroccan spices, you know, what the heck, I'm feeling a little bit more. Yeah, why not? I, I really want to prove a point here. I want you to taste those spices. So, put a little bit more. Squish it, push it down the middle of the plate. This could be a little smoother. Doesn't matter. Now, you know why? You just turn to people and go, that's rustic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now, get our, our lentils, place them down the center. Nice and creamy. So I know we're in the wrapping up mode. We're going to do a few questions here at the end. I know that the tastes are coming along in the area behind, directly behind us. Rick has a book. Is this recipe in the book or something like it? Um, I think so. Pretty so, sure yeah, we think so. Um, it is. So books if will be not, on sale. If it's not, here's my business card. I would be <laughs> glad to send you a copy of the recipe if it's not available today. And then I put a little cilantro on top as a garnish just to, just to give it a little bit of green um, uh, color. And the cilantro works really well. Cilantro has a cooling effect on your palate. You know, whenever you, you see something spicy, such as guacamole, salsa, all that, that's the reason salsa works, I mean, um, cilantro works so well. And you know what? It's cilantro two ways, if you really think about it, because in that Moroccan spice mix is coriander, which was the seed that made the cilantro in the first place. So there you have a super simple dish, a discussion, maybe a little bit of a better understanding about aquaculture. You know, I went into that room today thinking aquaculture was bad. It's not as bad as it used to be. There are people that are doing a great job. There's people that are doing a much better job. And there's some people that are still doing an okay job. So well, what I try to do is celebrate the great, recognize the better, encouraging them to be great, and hoping that the guys that aren't doing it so well either go out of business or figure out and go back on board. And then we have widespread solutions that are pushing us in the right direction to a more sustainable world. We're not eradicating species. We're closer to our food. We have a better understanding. I mean, the discussion can go on forever. I mean, it's, and when it's wild, you see, it's over, there's overfishing because that's technology's ability to, um, you know, to, to out, over, outfish a species, they, they can't keep up with the hunt. There's byproducts, the bycatch that comes up. When they're going after one targeted species in the wild, other stuff comes up, uh, up with it that we're not really targeting. So they, by the time you filter out everything you wanted, those fish are dead or dying, they get pushed back into the ocean. What a waste. What a waste of good protein. There's aquaculture, the effect that it has on the environment, and the effect that it has on the fish itself. The fish itself. Antibiotics, chemicals, you know, all, all, the, all the things that need to be added in order to keep it a healthy and viable investment for, a, for an aquaculture uh, owner. But there's also the environment, the, the byproduct, the effluent, the escapes, the fish around it, all the other things that need to be taken into consideration. And you think, like, really, aren't we exhausting this to, to, to a, you know, we're beating a dead horse? Isn't, has it really had that much of an effect on a, on a, on a world that two-thirds of it plus is covered in water? Yes, it is. Yes, it does. It has a major effect. We treated our ocean as our receptacle for way too long, expecting perfect food to come out of it. Because you can't just dump all the, all the, the junk that you don't want to deal with on land into the ocean and think that it's going to come out pristine. So all back, circle around, take, put your toys away at the end of the night. Put them back in the box. Put them back on the shelf. Next day, you take them down. They're perfect again. And you can enjoy great tasting food. Right? So Rick, how do you choose seafood that you serve and eat? How do I choose seafood? I use Seafood Watch, generally speaking, as my, uh, I, here we go, look at this. That was a lead-in question. I, know, I had a feeling that was. <laughs> no, this is the beauty of it. Seafood Watch, you, there's these little cards that, I, that outside there's a display. Please come out and pick one up. Put it in your wallet. Talk about it. It's super simple. Seafood Watch, what they do is they have three categories, red, orange, and green. Green means best choice. Go for it. And guess who's done all the research on overfishing, habitat destruction, byproduct, I mean, bycatch and all of that? 
Monterey Bay has, because they've got an incredible network of connections to scientists, to environmentalists, to uh, government uh, organizations, both non and government organizations. All of it gets boiled down to a red, green, and yellow. So if green, you can't get green, but ask for it, Yellow's okay, but there's still some issues with it, but it's a better choice than the red. The red means eh, avoid. Avoid for now. What do you mean for now? That's why you have an app, because at any given moment, it could change tomorrow. So you just push in on, you, you search for seafood or sushi, you push on that, you put in your species, I pump, punch in trout, E-R-O-U-T, it's gonna tell me, don't serve it at Google. No, it's gonna say, <laughs> good, best choice, best choice. Basically, trout is a pretty, doesn't, doesn't leave a heavy footprint. It's affordable, it's delicious. You're about to have a little bit of a taste of it as soon as we're, we're finished over here. But while that's happening, um, download Seafood Watch. It's a free app. Why not? You know, it's one more cool thing on your phone as you go down the 50 pages of stuff you got on there probably. But, you know, I've been talking about this for decades. In the beginning, it certainly wasn't very cool. People were like, oh, Moon, and really, what the hell now? You're going to make me take something else off my menu? You're gonna... It's not that complicated. It doesn't need to be that complicated. You know, when you go into a gas station, you're certainly picky about your octane level because you don't want to mess up your motor. You know, you pick the right thing. Pick the right thing here. You know? And food is what connects us all. It's the common language of the entire world. No matter where I go, I, I'm, I have a conversation going about, you know, I'm in Greece, I'm talking about octopus. How do you cook octopus? You know, oh, next thing you know, you got a 20 minute conversation going on with a cab driver. You know, so it's really, it's, it's really what makes us who we are, you know, and it's, 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 I've seen over my 35 plus year career thus far, so many changes, so many positive changes, but we're at a critical state as we grow as a, as a planet. And too many generations have distanced themselves from where's, where's, where's the food coming from? Is it really good for me? Is it good for my family? Is it gonna, is it gonna make me feel better? Does it taste good? All right, and, and, and I'm a proponent of all of those things. For some reason, early on in my career, it was instilled within me. Download the app. Become a know-it-all. Ask questions. Please ask questions. When you stand up to that fish counter, I guarantee you, if you have your app, if you have your app open, you already know more than maybe the guy behind the counter. Hey, where's it from? You know, and then you start to learn a little bit about other acronyms of life. There's millions of them in this world. They drive you crazy. MSC is one good one. Marine Stewardship Council. Pretty much of it has an MSC label on it. It had to go through this incredibly rigorous, uh, almost torturous um, selection process to get them to be approved. So that's usually pretty sound, sustainable choice when something has MSC on it. But if you look for the green, you're doing an amazing job. You go for yellow, no one's gonna really yell at you, but keep, keep trying for the green. Does that, does that answer your question? That was a great answer. What a lead up, what a lead up. Uh, I think it was the LA Times uh, had an article about how uh, mislabeled fish was mm -hmm. in, in restaurants. And when yes. they did the DNA testing, it was uh, often wrong. Or it, Do you think that was? Part of the chefs, part of the suppliers? Uh, well, it's a combination of both. And it's a great question because I'm not going to shirk my responsibilities and say as chefs, it's not our job. It's a purveyor's job. It is our job. It's our job to know. It's our job to ask. It's our job to doubt, and especially because of that. Great, great point, actually. You know, the most fi fish are mislabeled. Why? Darn stuff's pretty darn, it's pretty, pretty perishable. It's the most perishable inventory you're going to ever try to deal with in your life. I decided why not. I'll deal with the hardest to keep uh, products and it's like a hot potato, you gotta get rid of it, otherwise it's not gonna be as good. And I'll do it in the desert, in the middle of Las Vegas, Nevada. And talk about sustainability as a message. Why not? I like the challenge. So, yeah, if I'm a purveyor and, I, and then I've got the phone call from Rick Moon and going, listen buddy, I need swordfish. Um, but I need, um, you know, harpoon swordfish because, you know, it's the, most, it's the most sustainable method of going after swordfish. And the guy's going to go, how much do you need? 40 pounds. Put a hole in that fish. Make it look like it's a swordfish. Got harpoon. Yeah, we got harpoon fish. They'll sell it to you all day long. You have to trust your purveyors. You have to trust your sources as a chef. As a consumer going into a, a restaurant or a consumer going into a marketplace, open up your app. Be a know-it-all. Please be a know-it-all. Be a pain in the neck. Mention my name if you want. I don't care. Use me as the bad guy because it's not being bad because you're doing something good for the environment and yourself. So.
There's, it's a win-win situation when you ask questions. Labels to avoid. Hmm. Sheila, do you have an answer to that? I don't want to say, you know, there's certain countries that do a... Well, I think to answer your question, you know, everyone's sustainable out there today. Everyone. So you talk to a purveyor and he goes, yeah, 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 it's sustainable trout. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're getting that line, it kind of is a line, and a lot of our chefs are like, you know, these suppliers can be like used car sales. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's where, you, where did you want it from? Idaho, yeah, yeah. That's the is. ticket, That's that. sure. So I think what you're sort of looking at is if anyone just says sustainable, I'm always like, okay, they should have more behind that. They should be able to say where it's from, how it was caught, what's sustainable. Um, so I think the one I would most worry about is just like, yeah, yeah, it's sustainable. That's what I would worry about. Yeah. And if you don't have anything to back it up, then you're... <clears throat> That's what asking questions will do, add that accountability. Great question, though. Really, there's, there's no easy solution. There's no easy answer. Hopefully someday there will be. I doubt it. We're gonna just, you're just going to have to know where your food comes from. You're going to have to have a little bit more knowledge. And it's fun. Make it fun. Don't make it, don't make it a drudgery. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chef. So what are some of your favorites from the green list that you think that maybe we haven't cooked with or we, we haven't tried that you would want to recommend to us? Do you have a green list handy? <laughs> no, but when he's asking for my favorites. I, I love lower, if you eat lower on the food chain, generally speaking, smaller fish, you're, you're doing yourself a world of good because they're fast growing. They don't have any uh, health concerns or issues. PCBs, mercury, all Arctic char. Arctic char. Arctic char. I love Arctic char. Arctic char is categorically in the trout salmon family. Because trout and salmon are really, they're cousins, you know, so it's all good stuff. Striped bass? Striped bass from the East Coast. We're on the West Coast, so you're not going to see a lot of that. Sturgeon? Wait, but striped bass, also known as rockfish. On the East Coast? On the East Coast. Rockfish on the West Coast. Suddenly, not suddenly, but recently, um, became a sustainable category. Holy smokes, that opened up for me as a chef a list of choices of 39 different rockfish, of 24 different flatfish, lingcod, dab, sand dabs, all these things you probably haven't heard of. Eat something you haven't heard of. In a credible environment in here, they're doing a great job. Well, I mean, you know, you, you, don't, you don't go for bargain sushi and then get something that you never had because that, that might be a little scary. But you definitely want to take a step outside your comfort zone and get some flavor. So anyway, how's the trout? You're getting a chance to taste it. Is, did these guys do a good job? Chefs, good job. Thank you. We're thrilled. Um, did that answer your question? Okay, good. Yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up. Guys, I have we're business cards here. I highly recommend you take one or encourage you to. You come to Las Vegas, come and see me. You have any questions, email me. If I don't have the answer, I'll just send it to Sheila anyway. No, but Absolutely. And thank you so much, Rick, for being here. I learn something every time that I'm around this chef, so it's really exciting. Um, How to make just, a mess. <laughs> just can't thank you enough for coming out. You can't thank Google enough for having us here. Again, I hope you'll come down to the aquarium, join us. We have some great exhibits right now about octopus and different things. Um, your support brings chefs like uh, Rick into the Google kitchen and other kitchens, so we thank you. We really appreciate all that you do. So we're going to be uh, signing books and taking photos and stuff so um, the fun just goes on. So thank you all. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.